Investigators turned their attention to the critical seconds before Flight 3407 went out of control. They looked for clues that could explain why the stall warning went off when the aircraft was flying well within its safety margins. They discovered that this plane has a unique feature known as a reference speed switch. It governs the sensitivity of the plane's stall warning. Very few airplanes in my experience have such a switch. This airplane is the only one I know of that has an actual switch on the overhead panel. It was designed by the manufacturer to be an extra safety feature. Some kind of variable ref speed? Pilots are supposed to turn on the reference speed switch when they're going to be flying through icing conditions. And we'll probably be picking up some ice. When in the increase position, it reminds pilots to fly faster to counteract any drag effect ice will have on the aircraft. When you are in icing conditions and, and ice does accrue on the wing, it can cause the stall speed to go up. And so this ref speed switch correspondingly causes the warning to come on sooner or at a higher speed. What that switch does is it basically uh, changes the trigger settings for the stick shaker. So we had to ask the manufacturer, how does this switch work? And what we found was it was part of the system's description that the crews got when they went through training, but they didn't get a lot of training on how to handle that switch. It, it seemed like it was too simple to worry about. Investigators need to know if the crew of Flight 3407 had turned on the reference speed switch, triggering the stick shaker at a faster than normal speed. The flight data recorder doesn't show whether the switch was on. Investigators must find another way of determining its position at the time of the accident. Clint here. Clint Cruikshanks is given a new priority. All right, I'll see if we have it. Recover the ice protection panel from the Q400's cockpit, where the reference speed switch is housed. Since the panel was in the cockpit, finding it is a challenge. Most of the front end of the airplane was consumed by fire, and so we didn't find anything except for little balls of molten aluminum, uh, little wire bundles, and a lot of ash. But after an extensive search, Crookshanks discovers that the ice protection panel is one of the few pieces of the cockpit that survived. Bingo. However, the knobs and switches are barely recognizable. Crookshanks examines the charred panel to check the position of the reference speed switch. It was set to activate stall warnings at higher than normal speeds. We did find the ref speed switch in the wreckage and it was in the increased position. This discovery only raises more questions. We'll probably be picking up some ice. The cockpit voice recorder indicates that as Renslow was beginning his descent into Buffalo, he commanded his plane to fly at the normal approach speed. But what's strange is that with his reference speed switch on, he actually should have been flying faster, as this is what the switch would remind him to do. So why wasn't he? The plane's computer warned the crew to fly faster according to the settings they had configured by displaying a set of red bars on the airspeed indicator. But you may have a better quality of life in regards to... These bars are meant to warn the pilots that a stick shaker activation is imminent. If you're looking at the airspeed indicator, you should be aware that you're getting slow and the stall warning may come on. Jesus Christ! It seems Renslow and Shaw were caught off guard. Still, they could have easily corrected the situation. Once the stick shaker have activated, they could have uh, turned the switch off, or they could have put the nose down and increased their airspeed. It's clear to investigators that Flight 3407 wasn't in danger of stalling when the stick shaker went off. So now they need to know exactly what happened after the stall warning was activated. An animated simulation of the crash is constructed based on information from the flight recorders. Watch what happens just after the stick shaker goes off. It illustrates that just after the stick shaker was triggered, the plane suddenly pulled up. This action dramatically slowed the aircraft, and at this point, it did stall. Essentially, the airplane 
entered an aerodynamic stall from which it did not recover. It pitched over and hit the ground. Investigators are dumbfounded. Flight 3407 wasn't stalling when the stick shaker went off. But a few seconds later, it was. The crew's every action during that brief time now demands careful scrutiny. What did they do? It's a puzzle. How could a trained flight crew take a plane that wasn't stalling and in the space of a few moments make it fall from the sky? Anytime you have an apparent stall for no apparent reason, that's a, that's a mystery. You would expect that no flight crew would stall an, an airliner. So the question is why? The focus of the investigation now switches from the plane to the crew, specifically on the moves they made during the critical seconds after the stall warning sounded. We wanted to see if the way they flew the airplane was the way they were trained according to the standard operating procedures that are portrayed in their flight manuals. The flight data recorder retains information from more than 1,000 different aspects of the Q400's flight operations from the airspeed and altitude to the position of the rudder pedals and throttles. It also records the movements of the most critical flight control, the control column. Pilots use the control column to change the position of the elevators and ailerons, which manage the direction of the plane. The flight data recorder stores information not just about the control column's position, but how much force is applied to it as well. The FDR records what the control positions were. It has sensors built into the control column. It has sensors built into the control wheel. What Scott Warren finds when analyzing the control column's position is stunning. In response to the stick shaker, Captain Renslow should have pushed the column forward to bring the nose down and gain speed. But for some reason, he did the exact opposite. We found that the crew, instead of pushing forward, which is the normal response to a stick shaker uh, triggering, the crew was actually pulling back on the controls. This had the effect of pulling the nose up, causing the airspeed to drop and tipping the aircraft into an actual stall. Captain Renslow had apparently mishandled one of the most elemental piloting maneuvers, how to recover from a stall. Above everything, it requires gaining airspeed to get out of the red. The recovery procedure is fairly simple and straightforward. It requires pushing forward on the controls and adding full power. At any point in time, had the captain pushed forward on those flight controls, he had a reasonably good chance of recovering quickly. From everything we've gained, that stall was recoverable on a repeated number of levels on a repeated basis. There was no reason for that plane to go down. Investigators also learned that First Officer Shaw, in trying to help Renslow deal with the crisis, inadvertently made things worse. I put the flaps up! She retracted the flaps, reducing the amount of lift as the plane struggled to stay in the air. Had the First Officer simply called out, you're stalled, advanced the power, pushed the nose over, the airplane would have been able to recover. From a human point of view, it's sad to recognize that those sorts of things happened and the, the tragedy that came from that. It's concluded that Captain Renslow's failure to properly respond to the stall warning was the primary cause of the crash of Flight 3407. As the issue is now pilot error rather than mechanical failure, human performance investigator Evan Byrne is brought on board. His first question, why hadn't either Renslow or Shaw noticed that their airspeed was too low for the icy conditions? In this case, we can look back towards the fact that there were clear and conspicuous cues of the deteriorating airspeed that were not heeded by the captain. Byrne listens to the cockpit voice recording to try to understand what might have led to that oversight. Exactly. Where you could be home with your husband to take care of and all that stuff. He learns that the crew had been talking throughout the flight. The conversation continued during the landing approach. It's a violation of a rule known as the sterile cockpit, which bans non-essential conversation during critical phases of the yeah, flight. You're going to be upgraded in six months. Blah, blah, blah. 
quite simply. It prohibits conversations that aren't related to the operation of the flight. Let's do a descent checklist, please. We can do the approach checklist along with it. Yeah, sure. Uh, bug set. Byrne also discovers that because of the cockpit banter, the crew performed critical checklists and briefings late. Off, uh, hydraulic pressure and quantity. Distracted. The crew probably didn't see the red bar, indicating they were flying too slowly for the conditions the plane had been configured for. On approach checklist complete. Rock and roll. When crews deviate from standard operating procedures and perform checklists late or don't make the required callouts, they become more vulnerable to subtle mistakes that they may make inadvertently that could lead to startle and surprise or unanticipated events that they have to respond to. The evidence is unequivocal. The crew of Flight 3407 was badly distracted throughout the approach. He came in when we interviewed, and he said, yeah, you're going to be upgraded in six months. They had forgotten a key setting they had made that required them to fly faster than normal. They had missed indications that they were flying too slow for icing conditions. Then Captain Renslow had reacted incorrectly to a stall warning, sealing the fate of the plane. Evan Byrne wonders, what could have caused a trained airline flight crew to have made such missteps? He finds a clue on the cockpit voice recording. Excuse me. The crew was showing signs of fatigue. Could Renslow and Shaw have been too tired to function effectively on the flight deck? It's a tough question. Answering it will require tracking their movements during the 72 hours leading up to the crash. It's basic gumshoe detective work in the investigation where we're trying to collect as many facts as we can. Byrne interviews the families of the pilots. Can I speak to Mrs. Renslow, please? He studies the pilots' mobile phone bills and records of text messages. He searches the airline's computer system to determine if and when the crew used it to check their schedules. He needs to track their every move. And what time did Rebecca leave the house? We're talking to colleagues or other pilots, uh, Czech airmen, uh, instructors, and we ask all those people about the pilots, about their recent activities. He learns that neither pilot actually lived anywhere near Newark, but could not afford to stay in hotels on their salaries. Captain Renslow was earning $60,000 annually at Colgan Air. First Officer Shaw was being paid less than $16,000 a year, substantially less than an average bus driver. As a result, both pilots had made long cross-country commutes to Newark. Captain Renslow from his home in Florida and Rebecca Shaw from Seattle, Washington. In fact, Shaw had commuted all night from Seattle on a cargo flight that connected through Memphis. Captain Renslow had spent the night in the airline's crew lounge at Newark Airport, after having already worked two days. He was seen sleeping on a couch in the lounge. It was against company rules, but pilots who couldn't afford housing near the airport did it anyway. Records show that at 3.10 a.m. on the morning of the crash, Renslow was awake. He checked his work schedule on the airline's computer network. Next stop, Buffalo. At 7.29 a.m., Rebecca Shaw sent a text message to her husband, telling him she'd arrived safely in Newark. Hi, honey, it's me. Phone records indicate that later in the morning, Captain Renslow was on the phone several times. Rebecca Shaw was noticed having a nap, catching up on the rest she'd lost flying in the night before. It's not a lot of sleep. We ultimately concluded that it was likely that both crew members were experiencing some effects of fatigue at the time of the accident. Her job is to watch the airspeed. Uh, her job was to watch the instrument panel. And, and my view is she was fatigued to the point where it's like right here. 
in your soul doll. I think that's where she was, and, and he just was not capable. He was just, um, he should have been flying an airplane. The revelation leads John Kausner to become a fierce advocate for changes to the industry. He raises awareness among both lawmakers and the public about the need to improve regulations governing pilots at regional airlines. This is just saying we support 3407 families that are fight for aviation safety, and these representatives of congressmen and senators have done that for us, and we're very appreciative. He takes his fight all the way to Washington, D.C. We needed to do something, and so we began to advocate in Washington weekly, every other week. I mean, we've made innumerable trips down there. And immediately the families just gelled. We all attended the hearings and, uh, and began to, to say, this is what we can do. The crash of Flight 3407 focused the world's attention on a growing safety problem. The relatives of those who were killed will help eliminate that threat. The crash of Flight 3407 exposed wide-ranging shortcomings in the regulations that govern regional airlines. These smaller airlines now make up half of all daily passenger flights in the US. Their pilots are generally younger, less experienced, earn less, and work long hours. Their levels of safety are way different from the majors. They, they have a much lower threshold in training, in, in ability, um, so in pay, obviously, so they can't attract a higher qualified pilot. There are pretty low wages, uh, pretty difficult working conditions, and we don't seem to attract the same level of applicant that we used to. Some regional airlines get into a bind and uh, they have to hire the first people that meet the minimums. In the U.S., of the seven fatal accidents involving passenger jets over the past 10 years, five have involved regional airlines. Those include the crash of Delta Connection Flight 5191 in August 2006, which killed 49 people when the crew took off from the wrong runway. John Kausner's campaign to change laws governing pilots has paid off. We relied on your support. We needed your support. You nurtured us. We want to thank all of you from all of us. A year and a half after the crash, under pressure from Kausner and other victims' family members, the U.S. Senate passed a bill which toughens training requirements and forces the FAA to draw up new rules on pilot fatigue. Studies into the problem of overtired pilots are already underway. At the University of Iowa, researchers are developing a system that could help pilots resist fatigue stay engaged with the critical task of flying and prevent future tragedies like that of Flight 3407. Thomas Schnell is a human factors engineer. We use a, a number of neurocognitive and physiological sensors that we apply on, on uh, subjects, uh, pilots that we invite for our studies. He's studying how pilots stay alert on the flight deck as a test subject conducts a cross-country journey in a simulator. Using sensors, he can determine how alert and engaged a pilot really is. The research could lead to the development of fatigue detectors on airplanes. We are trying to predict uh, pilot state so that we can adjust something on the flight deck to prevent the problem from uh, getting worse or, or uh, starting in the first place. We monitor brain activity, eye movement activity, heart, uh, the EKG and respiration and, and other uh, parameters in an, in an effort to figure out what the pilot's or the crew's state is. Are they fatigued, overworked, uh, are they disengaged or distracted? This section is where they were really uh, drowsy and you can see that mm -hmm. the gaze has become kind of bored. Schnell instructs the flight simulator to trigger a major systems failure in the cockpit. It's no good. Everything's dead. Hydraulic systems have failed. Collapse 
crank up that heat map so we can see what this brain activity was. Brace for impact. When a, a crew is fatigued, what you might see is uh, their reaction to events may slow down. So you'll see mistakes being made uh, on the flight deck. It's precisely these kinds of mistakes on the part of Renslow and Shaw that ultimately crashed Flight 3407 and killed 50 people. It's a tragedy that should not have happened, that was foreseeable, was preventable, and it's repeatable if we don't do something about it. I'm focused and determined to change what exists and not have another dad sitting here.